This teaching is titled, What's the Problem with Christians? The problem with Christians, we don't know the Word of God. Most Christians, I'm talking about the majority of Christians. In the Old Testament, the Jewish kids had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. They had to memorize the first five, five books of the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean they were Christians, but they were raised to memorize the first five books of the Bible. This is discipline. When Jesus showed up and the Pharisees came on the scene, they also, they knew the five first books of the Bible. They knew all of Psalms, and they nearly knew all the prophets, the major prophets. That's a lot. They had to know a lot before they can get into their religious leadership they have. But we also see, if you read the Bible, that even though they knew all this, they didn't have much of a walk with the Lord. So there's Christians who read the Bible and they read it like a book and they're, gonna, they're not going to get what the Lord is trying to show. They like to say, well, I read the Bible already. Well, you might have read it, but you didn't understand it. Because we don't read the Bible. We study the Bible. The Bible is not a book to read. It's to study. These religious leaders knew a great deal of the Bible. And you've seen how they walked. They walked very religiously. They didn't walk as Christians. In 2 Timothy 3.16 All scriptures is given by the inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. Nearly every Christian man that has helped write this Bible died of a horrible death just so we could have this Bible, just so we could have the infallible Word of God. This scripture says there is no mistakes in the Bible. The King James Bible is what I'm speaking about. The King James. I'm not talking about these translations that are from the King James. I'm talking about the King James Bible. It was very important to these men and to God that we would have the truth. Because if we didn't have the truth, how could God hold us accountable for the way we live? He couldn't. But He made a point that we got His words. And like I said, these men had to die of horrible death just, just to write and, and get us these words from God. Many of the disciples died of a horrible death just for walking with the Lord. We need to praise God that we don't have to go through that. Amen. I mean, just think if we had to go through that. I mean, Christians now barely walk with the Lord now. Just think if we had to go through that. We wouldn't really have any Christians walking with the Lord. Some of us only have half the truth. And I'm going to show how that is. We're going to read how we need the Word, God's Word. But we also need the Holy Spirit. To be sanctified with the Lord. They go together. John 17:17. 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth, and thy word is truth. We are made right with God through his words. That's what it says right here. Through his words. Not walking the aisles at the church, not getting baptized, not going to church every every Sunday. No. The way we get right with God is through his words, his truth. That's how we get right with God. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We are born again by the word of God. Too many people out there think you get born again by walking the aisles, like I said, or getting baptized. These kids that get baptized, I've said it before, they are not getting born again. They're going through something that their parents wanted to go through or they saw other kids do it so they're doing it. These kids don't know if they want to give their life to the Lord until they get into the world. You got to get into the world and then you make up your mind. Okay, do I want to go and, and be with my friends that drank and party and do all this other stuff, be with girls or guys? And, you know, they hadn't gotten tempted yet. So they don't know if they want to get born again. It's just a a tradition with most religions that baptize kids. So we need the Word, the Word of God. It says we need the Word of God. We need the Holy Spirit also. Romans 15, 16. 
that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the, off that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. We're sanctified by the truth, the word of truth, and right here it says we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What did, Nicod what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? He told Nicodemus in John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. With these verses, we can see that we need both. Both of them. We need the Word of God, but we also need the Holy Spirit. It shows us right here with these verses. If you live by just the Word of God, but you don't use the power of the Holy Spirit, like I said, you've only, you're, you've only, you're half a Christian. Because you, you can be saved by the Word of God, but then you don't use the Holy Spirit. Which, we need both. We need both. And a lot of Christians, they don't know much about the Holy Spirit. They know about the Holy Spirit that comes in you for salvation, but they don't know about the baptism and the feeling of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit that gives you power when you're out there in the world. When you're out there in the world, you need this power. You can, you can have all the words of God in your, in, your, in your mind, in your heart even. But when you go out in the world, you need to have the power of the Holy Spirit to believe those words and to walk those words. You understand what I'm saying? We're in a battle out there. Christians are in a, Christians who walk with the Lord, when you go out, out into the world, when you leave your house and you're out in the world, you're in a battle. That's a battleground out there. Because we're going to be tempted either by the devil, his demons, or our own evil nature that we have, that we're born into. So as soon as we, we walk out, we're on the battleground. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. So we need the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. We can read his words, but we need the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatever, whatever I have said unto you. Also in 1 John 2.27 the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in. Now, after reading this verse, these two verses, you might be asking, well, why do we need the teacher? I mean, the Word of God right here says the Holy Spirit teaches us. Right? You might be asking yourself that. Well, if you're asking yourself that, here's the answer. If the teacher is a man of God, who do you think is preaching through that teacher? Jesus. The Spirit. Jesus. If he's a man of God in the Spirit, then you are being taught by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So we need teachers. Acts 8, 29 through 31. Then... The Spirit said unto Philip, Now the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understand thou what thou readest? This is a, this is a eunuch that uh, was reading the Bible, the words. And Philip went over there and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And in verse 31, And he said, the eunuch said, how, how can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And Philip did, and he helped him learn, teach, you know, he taught him the words. But again, the verse 29, it says, the Spirit, the Spirit said on to Philip. So Philip was filled with the Spirit. So this guy was being taught by the Holy Spirit. So yes. We do need teachers, but we need teachers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. We need teachers who are men of God. We have a lot of teachers out there that are, how can I put it, come from college. They're educational. They're, yeah, they're, educa <laughs> they're educated by man and not, and not the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I, I mean, just in church, I see that all the time. They go by man's teaching instead of the Holy Spirit. 
teaching is one of the gifts that God has given us. It's a, a Holy Spirit feeling gift. It's a gift. We can read that in the Bible that one of the gifts is teaching. And what do I what do I pray before I teach? I always pray, Lord, take over my mouth, take over my lips, take over my tongue. Let us hear what you have to say, not what Jesse has to say. Because what Jesse has to say, if it's my opinion, then I probably wouldn't even accept it. Okay? But when I pray to the Lord to fill me with the Holy Spirit, and I ask him, hey Lord, take over my lips. Then I'm saying, Holy Spirit, take over. Teach, teach them what you want them to hear. The Bible says that there's going to be many false prophets. And there is. There are going to be many false teachers. So you better check out whoever you're listening to. You know, a wolf can sound like he's a man of God. Because he uses scriptures. That's why we need to study the scriptures. Because we've got to make sure what he's saying... What he's teaching, he doesn't take it out of context. And believe me, a lot of them do. As you know, I give you the scriptures. I give you every scripture. Every scripture I'm going to use, I give them to you. For, for what? So you can go home and read them yourself. Well, let me see if Jesse was right. Okay? How many teachers do that? Check me out. Hmm. I, I don't... I have no problem with you checking out the scriptures that I use. Because believe me, I, I make sure that I know that I know the scriptures that I'm using, I'm not taking them out of context. And like I said, you have preachers out there who, who do. They make it sound better just so the love offering would be better. Okay? Psalms 118.8 And this is where many Christians fail. Many. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in a man. This is the word of God. Most Christians, I'm telling you right now, most Christians put their confidence in a man. I'm talking about a preacher or a teacher. They put their confidence in him. They, they don't read the Bible because they depend on that man to tell them what the Bible says. So their faith is in that man. Right here the Lord says it's better to trust in him. Than to put your confidence in a man. That's where a lot of Christians mess up. Because the Bible says there's many wolves out there. And you got Christians who are listening to wolves. And they're being misguided. That's why I'm studying. That's why I'm doing this teaching. We need to study. We need to know that's the problem with Christians today. They don't study their Bible. Now this should help us read the words of God and understand them. You can't just read a verse which a lot of people do. I read just a verse, but like I said, check me out, make sure I didn't take that verse out of context. But you got men who take one verse and they make a doctrine out of it. And like I said, and Christians take it because they don't know what, what it says before the verse. They don't know what it says after the verse. John chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 1, 3 and 5, 11 and 12 and 14. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now this is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. You got religions that don't accept this verse, they change it. But God said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. Now we're going to read verse 3 and 4. All things were made by Him. Who's the Him? God. We're talking about God here, right? Mm -hmm. That's all we know right now. From what we read, we're talking about God. So all things were made by Him. And without God was not anything made that was made. In God was life. And the life was the light of men. In verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Speaking, we're still speaking about God, right? It hadn't changed anything. And the Word was God. So we're speaking about God. Verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them He gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Now, until we get to the verse 14, all we know is this is God. All we know is this is God. God is all this. When you get to verse 14, 
Without verse 14, we could almost be lost. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. Those are some, those are some very, very important words right there. And the Word, and who's the Word? God. And, the, and God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Like I said, reading verses 1 through 13, if you was to stop right there, you wouldn't know Jesus was God, right? You just think, okay, well, it's God this, God that. But verse 14 tells us who God is. He came in the flesh, and we know who that is. Jesus. Can we look at Jesus? I mean, really, seriously. Can we look at Jesus and comprehend that we are looking at God? This is God. Come in the flesh. How many of us can really take that in? That this is God. Come in the flesh. Uh, if only would have known that. <laughs> God in the flesh. It plainly says it, right? That God. God, it talked all about God all from 1 to 13 and then it says the Word was made flesh. So Jesus is God. There's no if, and, or buts. You'd have to completely get rid of this chapter if you didn't want to believe that Jesus was God. All right. Let me give you an, another example of how to read all the verses. John chapter 4 verses 7 through 10. <clears throat> there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it thou, thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. That's why she said that. Which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given you the living water. Now when we read this, big question mark ought to come up. Big question mark. And he would have given thee living water. Do we know what living water is? I mean, we're just reading this chapter, and it talks now. It talks about living water. Before this, we don't we don't have, we don't know what living water is. So when we're reading the Bible, and you come to something like this, you need to keep that question in your mind. Okay, living water. I don't know what living water is, but let me keep reading, right? Because I need to know what this living water is, because this, this is what Jesus said. The answer to this question to to the question that we just got. It's not in chapter 4. It's not in chapter 5. It's not in chapter 6. we got to go all the way to chapter 7 to see what this living water is. And it's verse 37 through 39. It says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, well, wait a minute. Living water, that's right. I read it back then. I didn't know what it was. But now, now I know. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So how many chapters did we have to go before you realize what the living water is? That's why I say we have to study the Bible. People just read, they, they read that he would have given the living water. Okay, but they just keep on reading. Are they looking to see what this living water is? No, they just read. That's what's wrong with Christians who do read the Bible. They just read it. We don't know who the living water is until three chapters down. So I'm showing you when you read and you come across words or something, you don't understand, keep on reading. Just keep on reading. Now, these books that people get, and it gives you so many verses to read, devotions, I think they call them, or something like that, they give you so many scriptures to read a day. Now, how long would it be before you was able to learn what living water is? <laughs> By then, you done forgot that, that you had a question, what is living water? 
But people go by what man suggests. These are the verses you should read today. Oh my gosh, please, please hear me. Please get away from man. Get away from man. Read, let the Holy Spirit lead you on what to read, how much to read. He might just have you read one verse. Right. That one verse might be something he's going to really open up to you. But then he might have you read several chapters. But let, let the Holy Spirit lead you on what to read. Not these books. We got too many books. Christians depend on books <laughs> written by men. Instead of trusting in the Holy Spirit to teach them what to read, where to read. Yeah. It's like we're like these men, these books program us. Do we want to be programmed by man? No. I don't think so. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I'm, what am I teaching tonight? What is the problem with Christians? We're not being led by the Spirit. We're letting other books tell us what to believe, how to read, how much to read. We have to get away from this. We have to get away from it. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else, what shall they do which are, which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, this is verses I'm going to show you again. Last time I showed you, it was three chapters down before you could find out who the living water was. But sometimes when you're reading, it says, Else what shall they do which are baptized? So who's they? That's what I'm saying. When you're reading the Bible, it, the little words are very important. And so you should, you should be asking yourself, Who's they? What's, who's they? If you keep on reading and you don't see it, Maybe you got to back up. Maybe you should have seen it already. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. But let's go back to verse 12. We're, we just read 29. and It talked about a day, right? Well, if you back up to verse 12 and you read, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no res resurrection of the dead? So the day... Are the, are the ones who say that there is no resurrection of the dead. That's the who the day is. Do you see it? Because you, in 29 it says day, but you don't, unless you remember verse 12, the day is the ones who don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. These are idiots. Okay? Here they are baptizing for the dead, but back in verse 12, they said they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So why are they baptizing the dead? I hope y'all understand. I hope y'all yeah. y'all see what I'm trying to put here. We have a lot of doctrine today that's just as dumb as this. Now let me say this. There are people who believe that the Old Testament is no longer. And we know that. But did you know that the New Testament has 260 chapters. And that 209 of them quote the Old Testament. This is in the New Testament. Also in the book of Revelations, there's 404 verses. 278 verses are quoting the Old Testament. For those people who don't believe that the Old Testament is for today, they again, they only have half the truth. Because yeah. in Luke 24, 44, it says, And he said unto them, which is Jesus, these are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, this is the Old Testament, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, Old Testament. And then Jesus says, concerning me. Jesus is saying, the Old Testament is concerning me. Right. You read the Old Testament, you're reading about me. It says it plain and simple right there. <laughs> I mean, how can people... I mean, that's what I'm saying. People don't read the Bible. Somebody must have told them or they just think, well, that's Old Testament, this is New Testament. That means the old one's different from the new. No, I had a teaching on that. Jesus didn't come and change anything. The only thing that was changed from Old Testament and New Testament was the blood sacrifice. Right. Old Testament, animals, New Testament, Jesus. It was still blood sacrifice, but He was the final blood sacrifice. And that was the only thing different between the Old and New Testament. 
If you know how to study your Bible, you can take the New Testament and the Old Testament and fit them together like a glove. That's the Word of God. God can do that. Right. I'll use just a quick example. Ezekiel 3.18, I think. It talks about us being watchmen. And the Lord says, If we warn the wicked of their wicked ways, then their sin is on them. But if we don't warn the wicked of their wicked ways, then their blood is on our hands. It plainly says that in the Old Testament. Paul, in the New Testament, in Acts 20, verse 26, Paul says, I am pure from the blood of all men. So what do you think he was referring back to? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. He said, what he was saying is, I have witnessed to everyone that God brought my way. So I am pure from the blood of those men. See how they just fit together? Right. Now you take these translations, they change a little word over here and then change a little word over here. Now you can't fit them. Yeah. Now they don't fit together. This is a, this is a, a teaching in itself. There's many places in the Old Testament where Jesus, where Jesus appeared to man. When you read the Old Testament, it says the angel of the Lord speaking about Jesus. Like I said, that's a whole other teaching. But many times when you're reading the Old Testament and it says the angel of the Lord and the Lord is in capital letters, it's speaking about Jesus. And one day I'll, I'll teach on that. In John 10, Jesus is speaking to the, to the people. He says, it is written, speaking about the Old Testament, then in verse 35 he says, the scriptures cannot be broken. Meaning they can't be wrong. Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken. They can't be wrong. Now, if the scriptures are wrong, if we don't believe that the scriptures cannot be broken, if we don't believe that the Word of God is, is, was inspired by Him to write, then why are we living by this book? If you can't believe those, then just forget about it. Go do your own thing. Because unless you believe the Word of God is infallible, and the words, the scriptures cannot be broken, there's no use living for them. Only people who believe that the Bible is infallible and cannot have mistakes in it. If I was to find one mistake in this Bible, I would quit living for the Lord. But I haven't found any. I got born again at 25, I'm 59, and I've been reading, studying the Bible all that time, and I have not found a mistake. People find mistakes because they don't know how to read. They don't know how to fit this with this over here. They take script, a verse and take it out of its context. So lost people, or even Christians, they, they, they find mistakes in the Bible. I'm going to tell you, as a Christian man, I have not found a mistake in the Bible. Because like I said, as soon as I see a mistake, that's it. That's it for me. I'm going back to my old way of life. But believe me, I'm 59, I'm still here, and I'm going to stay here. Because the Bible doesn't have mistakes in it. And men who say that, woe unto them. That's all I got to say. How can you believe and worship him if you think he's a liar? How can you? They don't go together. But the scriptures are true. And we need to accept every word in our heart. Every word. Not what you want to pick. That's another mistake Christians make. Oh, I believe this, but... I'm going to leave this one alone. They've read it and they know what it means. But it's like, I'm going to block this one out. Christians do that. You're not walking with the Lord when you do that. You're not putting all your faith in God's words. We need to make up our mind. Do we believe all of God's words? Or do we just believe some of it? We need to make up our mind. Which one are we going to do? Because in Revelation 3.16 it says, So then, because thou art lukewarm... And neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus says, since you're right in the fence, some things you believe, some things you don't want to believe, since you're that way, he says, I'd rather just spit you out of my mouth. That's how bad the Lord, the Lord looks at that. Either you live for him 100% or don't live for him at all. That's what, it's, that's what the scriptures say. And this is why many Christians fall. I did this verse last week on Halloween, but I need to do it again. Ephesians 6.12 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, 
against spiritual weakness, wickedness in high places. We are wrestling against schemes and deceptions from the devil. That's what we wrestle with. Because he's, he's, he's a master at being deceitful. He's a master at that. I mean, look what he did to Christmas. He made Christmas so lovable with a Santa Claus. Do kids go to the, to the Lord and say, this is what I want? No, kids go to Santa Claus and say, this is what I want. He has taken the birth of Christ and totally turned it away from him. And the world celebrates it that way. Now, we as Christians shouldn't do that. We as Christians, I mean, this is what I do with my, my daughter when she was little. And I do it with my grandkids. I tell them, look, you need to ask Jesus for it. Ask Jesus for it. And just so you don't take Santa Claus completely out of the picture, which I might be wrong here. I, I should take him completely out of the picture. But instead, I, I tell him, look, ask Jesus for it, and then Jesus will give it to Santa Claus to give to you. That's what I do. But maybe I shouldn't even do that. Maybe I shouldn't bring Santa Claus into the picture at all. What did I say the other day? The Bible says, train the child up in the way he should go. Well, if I'm training up a child and I'm acting like Santa Claus is bringing them to give, that's a lie. So is a lie going to be training them right? This is just not coming to me. I'm getting this the same time you're hearing me say it. But we do these things because they're kids. Lost kids grow up to be lost adults. You hear me? You train a kid, a child, when it's young, to be a Christian and about Jesus only. When that child grows old, that's what he's going to believe. But if you teach him this other junk, you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The demons and the, the devil and the demons know that they're sentenced to go to hell for eternity. They know they're going to hell. What they're trying to do is take as many as people with them as they can. They already know they're going. So they're trying to take as many as they can. And they are. Because God said, broad. Broad is the gate that leads to hell. Narrow is the gate that goes to heaven. So the devil is going to take a lot with them. But that's, that's his point in life. Is to take down as many people as he can with them. And he is. Paul's reminding the people that our greatest enemy is not the world. Even though the world is wicked, but our greatest enemy is the spirit world. It's not your boss. It's not your spouse. It's not your in-laws. It's not your neighbors. It's the spirit world. The wicked spirit world. That's who our greatest enemy is. So all this time you've been fighting with whoever no, that's, that's, that's not who you're fighting. You're fighting at the demonic spirit world, which the devil and the demons, they use people that they have already that are not living for the Lord. They use them to get to us. And we, because we don't know the power of God, and because we don't read the words, we fall to it. So knowing this, we better be armed. Knowing that we're in a spiritual battle. Not a personal person battle. We're in a spiritual battle. And since we know this now, we need to get spiritually armed. Galatians 2, verses 13 through 15. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way... He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. Amen? Amen? That is a beautiful, that is a great verse for us. Because of Jesus dying on the cross, he defeated, the, he defeated Satan. And because of that, we that are born again Christians, it says, in this way, he has disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So Jesus is over these spiritual rulers. So do we have anything to be fear of? Mm -hmm. To be afraid of? We shouldn't. But we are. If you really ask yourself, if you think about your past, you'll see where there was times where you shouldn't have been scared, but you were. I mean, I'm in the same boat. We need, what did I say before? 
the curse of a Christian is a bad memory. We hear this like we're hearing it tonight. But God says He'll bring it to our remembrance when we need it. Amen? First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Who is gone into heaven, which is Jesus, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. Another verse. Everything's underneath Jesus. Everything. The power that raised Jesus from the dead and exalted Him in heaven, He's all-powerful. All-powerful. Our Jesus, the one who lives in us, that's one of the things Christians cannot take in. That Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, the Trinity, lives inside of us. Because if we really could take that in, we should not have no fear. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So what's the best way to fight the devil? To get closer to God. God says, get closer to me, and the devil has to leave. Amen? Amen. So if the devil's messing with you, get closer to the Lord. That's what it plainly says it right there. Right. You want victory in your life? Get closer to the Lord. We are set free. Galatians 1.13 who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dearest son. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Amen. Y'all y'all not y'all not listening. <laughs> y'all not listening. I, I heard you. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. I mean if this isn't good news, I don't know what good news is. He's delivered us from that. We have no reason to be fear Satan or the demons. Right. But many of us do. Many of us do. And we, I, I, we know it, but we don't open our eyes to it. We're like, I'm not. Well, think about it. Think about it. What has brought fear into your life? Like I said, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Fight against the spirit of the world. <clears throat> there is one trick that the devil uses on Christian. He gets us to think that now that we're born again, oh, I'm in no danger. I'm a born again Christian. We need to be careful of that because 1 Corinthians 10 verses 12 through 13, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. God is saying this. He's saying, if you think you're standing strong, you're a strong Christian, be careful though. Be careful that you don't fall. Only when you're totally trusted in the Lord can we have this power of safety. Unless you're walking with the Lord, you're not, you're, you, you have to be scared. Now when you're walking with the Lord, you're in His safety. You're, you're safe. Alright? We need to totally trust Him though. Yeah. Totally trust Him. Verse 13, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experienced. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. Now, no believer can claim the devil made me do it. We can't do that. People sin because they're willing to sin. It's not that the devil made them do it. They were willing to sin. We escape temptation not by getting out of it, but by going through it. The Lord sees us through it. And that's why we're able to endure it. Y'all hear? Mm -hmm. That's why we're able. He takes us through it. He don't take us around it. He takes us through it. And by going through it and enduring it, it brings us closer to the Lord and it makes us stronger in our walk with Him. Amen. Now, if He was to take us around it, is that, is that going to help us to grow? No, he says, no, you go through it with me. And once we get through it, you're closer to me, and plus, you've grown. Amen? Amen. So, uh, temptations, I'm not inviting them. <laughs> but if they do come, I'm going to go through it with, with the Lord. Amen? Amen? Jesus tells us in 2 Corinthians 12.10, For when I am weak, then I am strong. And it's a good one for when I'm weak, and believe me, 
Every one of us in here have times of weaknesses. We do. Every one of us in here. But when we're weak, then I'm strong. And why am I strong? Because we've allowed the Lord to. That's if you're walking with Him. Amen? Amen. When we're tempted, we should be gladly enduring His power. For His glory and for our spiritual growth, like I said. So, temptation, like I said, we're not going to invite it. But praise God when we have to go through it. Because he, He'll see that we'll grow through it if we go through it with Him. Right. Remember this, that Jesus, who was 100% man, endured more than we ever endure. And He was a man. He came, He was God, came in the flesh to be man. He made Himself 100% man. And He endured much more than we'll ever think we'll endure. He did it as a man. Not as God, as man. Also remember and stand on it. 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. I know you re repeat repetition. There's nothing wrong with it. And some of us need it. Because a lot of times some of us forget the verses. That we've heard many times already. We forget them. And the reason I know we forget them. Because I can see it. I see it. So if you're hearing something over and over. Praise God. Amen. We need. You know we're a slow people. We're a slow people. The Lord has to remind us. Continually. Who we are. And what we have. And this is why I'm doing this teaching. Until it sinks into our head. The best way to overcome temptation. Is. Mark 14.38 Watch ye and pray. Lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready. But the flesh is weak. So the best way to, to overcome temptation. Is to what? To watch for it. And to pray. Watch for it. And when you see it. You should go the other way. Or if you see you're going to have to go through it, then you pray. But he says to watch and to pray. That's the best way to, 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 to go against temptation. Watch for it and pray. God knew about the temptations we would go through, so he gave us a weapon to use. Ephesians 6.17 And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the, the Word of God. The helmet... Right here is related to salvation. That's what it says. And it shows that the devil directs his hits at our security and our assurance that we have the Lord. He tries to discourage us by pointing out our failures, our sins, and whatever seems negative in our life, he, he, he makes sure he points them out to us. And you're a Christian and that's what you did? Or that's what you said? That's the way you acted? That's the devil. Now, if it's true that you did act that way or did say that, then our, we ourselves need to repent. And let me say something about the word repent. The world, the church, also. We've replaced the word repent with rededicate. It sounds nicer. I'm rededicating my life. Makes me want to puke. You're not rededicating your life. You're repenting. That's what you need to do. If you were going this way and now you're saying... I'm going to rededicate my life. Well, no, you need to repent and then go this way. But we made a nice word out of it. I'm going to rededicate. Do you see? Do you hear me what I'm saying? Yeah. But that's what, it, that's what the devil does. He wants to discourage us. Point, pointing all this out to us. To make us lose our confidence in the Lord. And, and, he, and it works. It works. And let me give you an example. How the devil works. Elijah. The prophet in the Old Testament. He killed 450 false prophets. Elijah did. That Jezebel had brought to Israel. Now here's Elijah. Doing God's work. Then after he's done that. Things started to go down. Jezebel who brought those false prophets. Heard that Elijah had done this. And in 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 2 through 4. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She's threatening him here. She's threatening Elijah, saying, 
let the God strike me down dead if you're not dead by tomorrow. This is what Jezebel is telling Elijah. She's threatening him. What Elijah did next is what happens to us when we're not strong in the Lord. This is a prophet, a man of God. But he heard, he listened to this woman. And in verse 3, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servants there. He got so afraid, afraid that he ran for his life. This is a woman. This is a woman who just said that to him. And it scared him so much, he took off. He ran for his life. He heard this lie from the devil and ran. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a judipri tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. Elijah. Elijah. A prophet, a man of God, who stood without fear against, what did I say, 450 false prophets. One man, Elijah, stood before these men, slayed them, and he became frightened of his life because of what a woman said. You hear me? Who you, who's using Jezebel? We don't fight against flesh and blood fight against the spirit world. So who was using Jezebel to threaten this man of God? No. And did he fall to it? Yeah. And because of that, he prayed to the Lord that he would be taken home. He said, Lord, I, I've had enough. Take me home. I'm ready to die. Is that us? No. I have to admit, sometimes it's me. Because things, I mean, I could see when the devil's attacking me. And it's been, hasn't been like lately, but in my earlier years when I was doing this, I was, things were happening. And I'm like, I wanted to say, okay, okay, I'm going to stop. But then I'd be giving the devil the victory. What am I doing? I'm going to stop because these things are happening. And this was, like I said, this was earlier in my teachings. It did happen to me. I wanted to stop because I didn't want these temptations hitting me anymore. But God showed me, hey, I'm with you. And I saw he was with me. So that's why I'm still here today, doing what I do. I've been doing this for, I don't know, a lot of years. But Elijah dropped his gourd down, and look what happened. Right. He dropped his gourd, and look what happened to him. He gave victory to who? The devil. The devil. Do we want to do this? No. no. Of course, later on in the chapter, you know, it shows where God did take care of him. Didn't take him home, but he did take care of him. Got him back to walking with him again. Amen. I mean, yeah. that happens. <laughs> you know, that's what the Lord does. If we have the words of God, and we believe, and we live like we believe, you are going to be so victorious in your life. You will have a smile on your face every day. If we believe the words of God. Of God. Not what men write. Not these books, okay? I am really get fed up with books. Everybody's writing books. You listen to the 700 Club, you got all these stories. How God came into it. Well, you know, that's real nice. But, hey, I need the Word of God. Give me the Word of God. These stories, yeah, they're nice, but give me the Word of God. You hear me? Mm -hmm. Give me the Word of God. That's what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. We need to put our trust in the Lord and quit putting our confidence in the man, which that's one of the biggest problems Christians have, is they put their trust in the man and not in the Word of God. They don't put it in the Word of God because they don't read it. They don't study it. So the question was, what's the problem with, what's the problem with Christians today? Well, I just gave you a teaching on it.